Hello, everybody. This is episode number four of Patterson in Pursuit. I am your host, Steve Patterson, and I'm joined today by Dr. Brian Kaplan, who is a professor of economics at George Mason University, and he's also the author of several very successful books. We covered a lot of awesome ground in our conversation. We're talking about democracy and voting, how law and order might be produced by entrepreneurs instead of governments, and we also talked about Dr. Kaplan's upcoming book, The Case Against Education where he challenges this idea that school is all about learning and getting practical skills. Instead, as he puts it, it might just be a signaling mechanism to future employers, like getting a shiny badge on your chest or a nice shiny sticker on your forehead. For all the relevant links and information to his books and his website, check out the show notes page at steve-patterson.com slash four. It's a great conversation, and you'll notice that a few minutes into it, the audio quality changes rather abruptly. And that's because there was a lawnmower that started just outside the window right after we began our interview, so we had to move to another room that didn't have quite as good audio quality. But, you know, that's just part of the fun of getting these interviews in the field. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. So first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Brian Clapton, for sitting down and speaking with me today. My pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of your work, and I really like, too, that you are kind of an unabashed nerd. You've embraced mm -hmm. your nerdiness. and I'm an uh, openly nerdy man. Yes. I think we're beginning, beginning to see kind of a renaissance of, of more confident nerds out there. That <laughs> I'm a nerd, and they're proud of it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Renaissance, I mean, that makes it sound like you know, Renaissance means rebirth. I'd say it's the first time. It's the, it's the dawn of nerd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I appreciate that. Also, you have a few kind of contrarian positions <laughs> that you hold, uh, which I want to dive into. There are many to choose from, but your work that you're probably most well known for, you wrote a book called The Myth of the Rational Voter. Mm -hmm. I think the subtitle is Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies. Right. Very excellent and provocative title. And so I kind of wanted to pick your brain a little bit on that. In, in America, at least, and probably Western civilization in general, we're taught that democracy is this wonderful thing. It's above mm -hmm. criticism, that, mm -hmm. that it's almost her heretical to think that democracies could do something wrong or that mm -hmm. maybe there's a better way of having mm -hmm. uh, a society structured than around democracy. What is your position on this? What is the myth of the rational voter? Right. So... In layman's terms, I say the myth of the rational voter is the idea that if most people think something, or most voters think something is a good idea, then it is a good idea, and that we should do it. Right. Um, so I would say that there's sort of two versions of this. So there's the popular version where politician just says, America wants this, and then no one is going to say, yeah, well, America's wrong. America's made some mistakes. Let me explain how America's wrong. Uh, so in popular terms, that is what I think of as the myth of the rational voter. And then among academics, they have taken this general idea and they have refined it into something that seems more technically defensible. So among a, a lot of academics in economics, in political science, there's the idea that sure, voters make mistakes, but voters' mistakes are right on, are, are true, or, vote, or voters' beliefs rather are still true on average. So voters may go too high on some questions, too low on some questions, but these errors balance out, so some voters will be too high, some will be too low, and leaving the typical voter, uh, making the typical voter correct. And so when politicians go and compete for voters' favor, the fact that a lot of people don't, don't know what they're doing is actually not a problem. Mm -hmm. So some people think that free trade is worse than it really is, others will think it's better than it really is, and the average view will still be correct. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a more technical sense in, w in which a lot of social scientists believe in rational voters or rely upon the idea of rational voters. And what I just say is that both the popular and the academic version of this view are wrong. We can go and test this in a lot of different ways. We can just go and measure public opinion against the facts and see that the voters are often very wrong, uh, in, uh, you know, even on very narrowly defined objectively, uh, objective questions. And you can actually see that often voters, uh, voter, the, uh, the average voters' views are very far from the truth. So it's not just that some are too high and some are too low, but there are systematic patterns. And then on top of it, uh, there's also the fact that the way people especially think about politics, economic policy, is just so far from what a reasonable person would do, just in the way that people are so emotional about it, uh, the way that they'll form strong opinions without having studied the facts, uh, the way that they'll make claims that they don't want to bet on, which again is a sign, uh, you know, to, me, to my mind, you know, is, is a smoking gun that 
while on some level they may think they've got it figured out, on a deeper level they realize they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So can we get some specifics maybe about what are the policies that the result of the democratic voting process is just totally wrong? Mm -hmm. Right, so one that economists have been talking about a long time is free trade versus protectionism. Almost everyone who can explain economists' argument for free trade believes it, but hardly anyone can explain it. Out of people who have never heard it, almost everyone is protectionist. Uh, so when you, again, when you look at public opinion data, you'll see that, you know, especially out of, you know, out of people who've just not, never studied economics, there's very strong support for the idea of just keeping out foreign products in order mm -hmm. to enrich ourselves. And again, like in a way, like, you know, the economist argument, the simplest way of putting it is, look, suppose that everyone else on earth worked for us for free, just gave us free stuff, would that be bad? No, then how could it be bad if they give us cheap stuff, right? So, right. I mean, like the best thing would be if, the, if everyone else on earth just gave us whatever we asked for for free. So the second best thing is they give it to give it to us for cheap. So keeping out foreign products is just a way of impoverishing a country. Uh, and yet, despite this, there's no country on earth that really has free trade. And there, there are some that, are, that, are that, are, that are, have more protectionism than others. Uh, you know, it's the kind of policy that you know, economists have just been scratching their, their heads and saying, like, why is this stuff so popular? And uh, you know, my story is that you know, it really comes down to people like blaming foreigners for whatever problems they have. Uh -huh. They have this, uh, you know, a distrust of foreigners that might have been functional 10,000 years ago when you're, li when, when you're living on the savanna and you know, a new tribe shows up and, and you know, in that case you maybe should be afraid of them. But when a Toyota dealership sets up in your, in, in your area, there's, there's no reason to be very scared of it. And yet, so in some way, people still are. So is there any um, superior alternatives if we're not letting these kind of economic policies be driven by popular opinion? What should they be driven by? Yes. Uh, so we, the you know, simplest thing I talk about is there are many areas where you could just not have policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the United States Constitution, we don't, you know, US, the U.S. does not have a religious policy. We have a official non-policy of uh, religious toleration. And you know, there are many areas where people feel like it's just better for government to do something, and or government has to do something. And and really, like you know, when you think about it, it's like, well, why? Why can't government just do nothing about this? So why can't there be you know, a policy a, a, a policy of government just doesn't have a say over this area? Uh, some other things I talk about, uh, you know, like, you know, so uh, in in terms of the least radical thing you could do, uh, I'm a big fan of just stopping encouraging of voting. So stop all the social pressure to vote. There is good evidence that people who, that, 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 uh, that you know, in, in general, uh, you know, more, more educated and better informed people are more likely to vote, and the effect of get out the vote campaigns is to reduce the average quality that people are voting. So I'd say really be better to send the message of if you haven't carefully studied all the following areas, please, as a civic service, do not vote. <laughs> so uh, that, that will get you thrown out of polite company to say such a thing isn't kind of what you're saying. Um, to the extent that we have a, uh, a democracy, it would be better for less educated people to be ruled by their more educated neighbors? Yeah, so, you know, so you know, the simple thing is just to refrain voluntarily. In the same way that if there's a, you know, an operating room, we don't say, you know, it doesn't matter where you make the incision, just make an incision somewhere. Uh, instead, we say, look, only someone who knows what he's doing really should be involved here, and other people as a, uh, other people would be irresponsible for other people to participate when they don't know what they're doing. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, it would be better if people would defer to people who have actually studied the issues and know what they're doing. Uh, now the main concern that people have here is usually the idea that people vote selfishly, so this will just lead poor, uh, you know, poor, uneducated people to not participate, and then there'll be a bunch of policies that are only good for rich people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a lot of public opinion on this too, showing that in fact, Self-interest has very little effect on how people vote. People generally are voting for the policies they think are best for their society. And the only question is really what, what is the quality of your thinking about what's best for society? And people who know more you know, do actually choose policies that make more sense. So is your preferred solution in the ideal to have a governing system where you have educated people making the decisions, or is your ideal system that there's none of the democratic voting stuff at all? Yeah, so it's a question of democracy versus dictatorship. Then, uh, yeah, dictatorship is a whole bunch of problems, and when I criticize democracy, it is not to praise dictatorship by mm -hmm. any means. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is that democracy would work better if, the, uh, if uh, people who didn't know what they were doing just didn't participate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you know, would, it, you know, would it be better if they were not allowed to participate? Uh, yeah, I think that too. Although you know, probably the better way of handling it, the, you know, the politer way of handling it, it would just be to give extra votes to people who know more. I also have a proposal which is more moderate than this, and it just says, look, every year there is a test of political knowledge, and you get, and if you take it and get a good score, you get some money. Okay. The end. <laughs> All right. Now, what's the point of this? So there's, there's two points. So one of them is to encourage people to learn more about politics. Uh -huh. And the other one, though, is to encourage people to maintain their knowledge. That's why the test is given every year, and you can repeat it as often as you want. Because not only is, you know, is it, uh, you know, do we see that uh, public schools are not very good at teaching, you know, teaching knowledge of politics and history and related areas, but also we see that when people do learn stuff, they generally quickly forget. So this, uh, this proposal for an annual national test with monetary rewards for good performance is designed to solve both problems at once. The solved problem of there are better ways of learning this stuff than the way, the way that we generally currently do it, and two, to uh, solve the problem of retention. So what if the um, spectrum that mm -hmm. we're talking about isn't between a democracy and a dictator, but rather a democracy and just no government. Mm -hmm. Is that? Do you have a position on that? Yeah. So, me, my general view is democracies and you know, you know, wind up messing up so many things, and there really is this catch twenty two where to convince people that they shouldn't participate, you'd have to actually con actually show them show them to their own satisfaction that they're wrong. So, yeah. So, I think that. Of, you know, that you know, there you know, there are many areas where it would be much better if uh, democracy sim simply didn't get involved at all. So you know, if there were a constitutional amendment saying that you know the United States will have free trade and we just don't have a discussion about whether we do it anymore. Well, what about even yes. a more yes. radical position? Yes. So it's like mm -hmm. we don't because because in that um, framework you still have the political document right, of right. the Constitution. Right, right, sure. What if we push it even farther and say, mm -hmm. how about none at all, no, just yes. pure anarchism? Yeah, yeah, so anarcho-capitalism. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I don't talk about anarcho-capitalism in the Russian voter because mm -hmm. I wanted to build on areas where there was more, much, more, much more of a consensus. Right. Uh, but yeah, so, I, uh, so you know, I, I, you know, are we assuming your readers know what anarcho-capitalism is? Uh, well, no, it, it doesn't have to be labeled anything. It's just in yes. your, not necessarily yeah. about your book, but your own political right. philosophy. Yeah, my own political philosophy, yes. So I, you know, I am an anarcho capitalist, not the crazy kind, as, as, <laughs> as I like to say, not someone who thinks that if we just pushed a button today and got rid of government, the things would improve. I think would, like, you know, you know, any radical change like that generally ends up uh, as a bloodbath. Uh, but, the, you know, but the idea of a world where you know, where the most basic functions, what we think of as the most basic functions of government are actually just governed by supply and demand. I think that would be a big improvement over what we have, or at least an improvement. Um, although, you know, I, I realize this sounds crazy, and it's, this is the kind of thing you'd have to really talk about it for hours just mm -hmm. to get over the impression that it's insane. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. something that, that I'm certainly going to be talking to a lot of people about, and in my own work I cover a bit. Mm -hmm. um, for you, I wonder, do you have a short uh, maybe an economic explanation mm -hmm. for how in that kind of society right. you would have the production of something like law and order, which, mm -hmm. which most people object to. They say, well, I understand democracy is flawed, but you can't have, right. you have to have the constitution or some kind of legal framework in order to work. Yeah, so when I talk about this, uh, I usually just like to start with some facts about the world today and mm -hmm. then, and then think and just, and then just picture moving in a further direction. So right now, it is not true that government has a monopoly over police, not true that government has a monopoly over courts, and not true that government has a monopoly over law. Okay. There are already, lar uh, the, these are already areas where the private sector does a lot. So, you know, for police, you, got, you know, there are more security guards than police in this country. Uh, again, for, uh, you know, for, uh, for courts, uh, the private, private arbitration is a huge deal. Uh, you know, if you have a problem with your credit card statements or with a company, you don't go and take them to court. You go and call up your credit card company, and they have a system where they resolve it all on their own. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, you know, so laws as well. There are all sorts of private organizations that have their own rules. Uh, the way that you know, including say, you know, if you want to uh, have, if you want to be able to use credit cards with a Visa Corporation, you have to agree to a bunch of the rules in order to participate. Right. Uh, so uh, you know, so and you know, and these things are all the you know, these are not just small little little little, little weird uh, weird weird anomalies. These are actually uh, you know, these are large areas where the private sector is already doing a lot of this. So really, what I you know the way that I like to think about it is just imagine that we just start moving further in that direction. Mm -hmm. So imagine that security guards, uh, you know, that the police do less and security guards do more. Imagine that uh, that the private courts have more authority than they currently do right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, a big limit on private courts is that 
you cannot really truly sign a binding arbitration clause. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can sign it, but uh, yeah, ultimately you can always go and complain to a public court and get them to, and, and, and they will, under, you know, and they will in many circumstances just say, well, yeah, you signed a binding arbitration clause, but this is contrary to public policy. So you know, an obvious way to greatly expand the role of private courts is just to have a, a blanket policy of, look, if you signed a binding arbitration clause, then tough luck. Whatever it says, you have to live with. Right. Uh, next time, you better go and take a closer look at what, at what the contract says. Again, so this is, you know, there's a reason why government doesn't want to allow this, which is that if there were private courts, people could, have, uh, could actually get, uh, they could work their way around most regulations. Right. You know, so for example, the minimum wage. You, know, you could have a minimum wage law in the books, but if part of your condition of employment is if there's ever a dispute about your wages, it's uh, handled by an arbitrator who happens to be the brother-in-law of your boss. Mm -hmm. This way, you could eviscerate almost any regulation of, of, of labor markets for being a, a freedom of contract, which, in my view, since the regulations are a bad idea, this would be a good thing. So, in that, uh, and when we're talking about law, there's generally two areas um, where people get hung up on. One is contract law, and mm -hmm. one is criminal law. Sure. So, how do we resolve contracts? And I think what I have heard mm -hmm. um, is that when you're talking about international trade, you also have mm -hmm. these massive private trade organizations sure, sure. that. that um, are the arbitrators that dispute mm -hmm. uh, contract disputes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, some, some public, some private. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have criminal law, this is the mm -hmm. thing that every mm -hmm. the axe murder, yes. or how could you, right. number one, how could you provide for the actual physical protection? Mm -hmm. And two, would there be a way that you envision where you could get um, like restitution or would there be jails? Mm -hmm. How would those kind of difficult mm -hmm. things work in, in your society that you're envisioning, the anarcho-capitalist society? Uh, yes. So again, just think. You know, so you know, like I say, you know, I think it's always better just to think about what we have right now and just imagine moving further in that direction. So once you accept the idea of a contractual, you know, a contra of, of contractual courts, right, where we've signed a contract saying that this is going to be arbitrated by a certain person and that their and their decision goes, then the next step is realizing that anyone who happens to you know who, whoever is the landowner of wherever you're occupying. Uh, the uh, you know, most obvious thing is, by default, they get to decide with the, who the arbitrator is on, you know, uh, for, for anything that happens on their, on their, ter on, on their land. Mm -hmm. And in this way, you know, so if there's a criminal who happens to break onto some property and, uh, and does something, then they're subject to the law and the decisions of whoever it was that was selected as the arbitrator of the owner of that land. Uh, so that's, 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 well, that's one obvious way. So, you know, like if you go to a mall and you go and, 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 and steal stuff, then the mall actually has a system where, well, you know, here you are. If you don't like it, you don't, you don't enter onto our, you know, if you don't like, if you don't like the way that we handle alleged pickpocketing, don't come into our mall. Right. Right. Uh, so you have that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, now, you know, it, you know, so you know, like you know, when you start thinking about more, you know, more, more radical proposals, you know, more general idea is that in a functioning, and this is sort of the key thing, you know, once you imagine an anarcho-capitalist society, anarcho society functioning, then the obvious thing to do is to have, it have some kind of insurance company that takes care of your issues. And then, you know, you know, there, are, there, are, there are competitors here, but once you, once you think about the insurance model, what happens right you know, in today's society, what happens if two people get in an accident and they have different auto insurance companies? Normally, their auto insurance companies go and talk to each other and they, again, have a system for handling it. Uh, so they may have it have actually have an arbitrator that does it, or they may have their own uh, own system they've worked out. So again, you know, so if you can think about the, uh, right now, if you get an auto accident, you you call your insurance company, and the other person calls his company, and they work it out. Similarly, if someone is accused of a criminal offense, you call your you call your defense company or your defense insurance company, they call theirs, and again, they have worked out what the procedure is. So even though you don't have a contract with the person that's accused of the crime, you have a contract with someone who has a contract with someone who has a contract with him. Right. And in this way, you can handle that problem. I like that uh, response. And it, it, when you were talking about um, the shoplifter scenario, mm -hmm. I like that that also kind of aligns the incentives of the shoplifter mm -hmm. and the stores, mm -hmm. because the shoplifter then has an incentive to to know the rules of the yes. store that he's vandalizing, which mm -hmm. then yeah. means the shops have an incentive to have sensible um, right. rules about right. that. Right. You know, so, I mean, I think people immediately start worrying that the malls will set up a kangaroo court where you just step on the step, you know, like you take shot. one step in and then immediately you're accused of being a pickpocket <laughs> and, and then the court says you owe us your house in exchange right, because right. We, you took a candy bar allegedly. Uh, so, 
you know, these kinds of worries are you know, you know, theoretically amusing, but again, if you just look at the way that almost any business works, this would be suicide because business is relying on reputation. If you were to treat the first person who steps into your store this way, then the word gets around and nobody's going to want to come to your store. Right. So, I mean, actually, you know, the real way, the way the real world works is that businesses generally enforce much less of the law than they actually could. Uh, so, you know, because they, you know, they don't want to make people feel uncomfortable when 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 they set foot in there. So, right. uh, you know, they, instead, they, you know, they rather you know, rather than businesses vigorously insisting upon their legal rights, normally they bend over backwards to make people feel comfortable. Right. So, you know, so you know, like, you know, if you know, if you don't appear to be a criminal and you accidentally walk out of a store, you know, walk out of a store with a candy bar, and they catch you, you know, the act, in reality, they're unlikely to actually try to put you in jail for that. Instead, yeah. you know, as long as you appear to not be a criminal. And it doesn't happen. What it doesn't happen twice. Right. What I've heard as well is, at least when I grew up, where I grew up in upstate New York, um, apparently they had Walmart had a policy where if you were shoplifting and you made it out of the store, they couldn't pursue you out of the store, like mm. into the parking yes. lot, because there might be a, you might run into a car. You don't want to get tackled, uh, and they had the yeah. PR. So yeah. <laughs> that was the yeah. that they had the gate yeah, <laughs> there. Yeah. If you made it out, yeah, it's an inter inter interesting example. Yeah. I mean, of course, if there were fully private arbitration, then Walmart's arbitrator might say that whatever happens when you're being pursued for pickpocketing is your own fault or strict right. liability. Right. Uh, so, it's, you know, but but nevertheless, you know, the point of businesses don't try to push things up to the legal limit because they want you to come back and want you to feel comfortable in their store, and they don't want bad word of mouth to get around. And then, you know, this has always been true, but I think the internet has made it much clearer how powerful reputation really is with right. all the ratings and reviews and how important they are to businesses. Uh, you know, it re really has given people a feeling of really businesses. You know, businesses want me to be happy, right? right. You know, they want the you know, I'm the customer. They want me to be happy. And re and really, you know, sort of like a very general rule in business is if you ask for something, you'll usually get it. <laughs> uh, you know, like this is the most obvious place, like Costco, where you can buy anything and then return it to them in an unresaleable state, and they give you and they ask, "Was there anything wrong with it?" No, I didn't like it. All right, fine. Here's your money back. <laughs> And you um, try, yeah. Yes, you know, and why would Costco do this? My dad is always, how can they stay in business? You know, dad, I think Costco's got a pretty good business model. I think yeah. they've figured out that while this does have some cost, it does make people feel really comfortable buying from Costco. Well, speaking of business models, we have quite the contrast from the, the private sector in Costco to something like uh, government, uh, where everybody's had experiences at the DMV, where they don't mm -hmm. give a rip about your mm -hmm. satisfaction, right. you know, or even the court system. <laughs> but also an area that I'm interested in, and I know you're interested in because you have an upcoming book on the topic, mm -hmm. is um, the area of education and yes. higher education. You have a book coming out that's called The Case Against Education. Right. And as I mentioned before we started the interview, I had a job a few years ago where I got to I travel around and talk to professors and students, and I have to say there are a lot of students who are not pleased with mm -hmm. the service that they're getting right. from colleges and higher education. Mm -hmm. So I, I was hoping we could talk just a little bit about that, mm -hmm. your sure. case against education. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, so again, it's, you know, my book is not just about higher education, it's about education in general. I mean, like, uh, like every complaint I have against college applies at least as strongly to K-12 through in my experience. Uh, so the heart of this book is what economists call the signaling model of education. Uh, the idea of this is that a lot of the reason why education pays is not that you're learning useful job skills in school, but rather you're jumping through hoops in order to get a sticker on your forehead. Right. You're showing off in order to convince people that you are among, the, among those that will actually finish their education or, you know, or get a degree or get certain grades or get a, in a certain major. Uh, so anyway, uh, in the signaling model of education, from the student's point of view, it really doesn't make much difference whether the signaling model is true or not. Because all you need to know is I go and I sit there for four years and then I get a better job at graduation at the mm -hmm. end. Who cares about why? But from the point of view of education policy, it makes an enormous difference. Because if education is really building skills, then you can actually have a lot of people get a lot more school and then they become more skillful and then they, and then they will have better careers. And since they become better workers, their training actually pays for itself, where people you know, people who now are able to do more things, they make more money, but they're making more money because they're producing more stuff. So uh, if uh, education is really about building skills, then it's a path to national prosperity. But on the other hand, if it's really just about jumping through hoops and putting stickers on your head, then education is a path to, na uh, to national misery, national poverty, because if everybody gets additional degrees, this doesn't mean that everybody can be the best, everybody's the best, just means that the standards that employers will impose in order to decide whether you're good enough to hire will go up. Uh, so one of the big things that happened in the last 50 years is credential inflation, where mm -hmm. the education that is required to do to get a given job has increased a lot. 
And signaling model is a very good explanation for this, which is that employers don't really care whether you know Shakespeare. What they care about is are you in the top 20% of the distribution? And the more education people get, the more you need in order to get the same jobs that you had before. So that, that is the heart of the book. I talk about a lot of other things in the book too, but the overarching point that I make is that what you learn in school has very little effect upon your productivity as a worker, which means that to a large extent education is a zero-sum game and not the skill factory that we like to imagine it is. So that seems uh, very persuasive and it certainly seems clear when we're talking about um, maybe really soft sciences like somebody yes. that has the underwater mm -hmm. basket weaving yes, degree. Yes. What about um, the harder sciences, sure. something Engin like engineering, computer in, science? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, those, those, so the, that's, that's a great question. So here's the thing, people who have never done engineering and computer science tend to think that engineering and computer science are the exception that proves the rule and it's just all learning skills like every minute of every, minute of every class. Right. But when you talk to anyone who's actually done the degrees, then, oh, no, 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 that's not how it is. So my dad was a PhD in electrical engineering. A lot of the time that he spent in class is on doing proofs, doing things that no one outside of university will ever pay you to do. Hmm. Really, and again, why is this? Well, it's because professors teach what they know and they teach what interests them. So if you're going to be a professor of engineering or computer science, you're a lot more interested in engineering theory, computer science theory, than you are in actual applications. To, you know, at least you're more likely to be so. And what this means is even in those areas, we will, people do waste a lot of time. I mean, a, lot, a lot of it does seem to be signaling. You know, a fun example is there are degrees in software engineering and computer science. Software engineering is much more vocational. Computer science is much more theoretical. But the one that pays more is the computer science degree. And if you ask people in it, well, the computer science, that's the one for the smart people. That's the one for the hardcore, the hardcore awesome geeks. And software engineering is a bit easier, so even though it's adding more value in terms of job skills, nevertheless, the signal that it sends is, well, if you're doing software engineering, you didn't think you were good enough to hack real computer <laughs> science with real programming theory, which you'd never use on a job, but still, it's what the really, it's what the really hardcore people do. Now, again, you know, just to be clear, you know, my view is certainly not that education is 100% 100% signaling. That's a, that's a view that people put in my mouth all the time, even though I've never I've never said it in print. I may have suggested it casually when I'm speaking, just because I'm I'm not checking the sentences that carefully when I you know, but I, although I try to. Uh, but you know, my my ultimate the ultimate view is that about 80% of the payoff for education comes from signaling. About 20% is from building up skills. So sure, skills teach you reading, writing, and math. If you do computer science, you learn some programming. Engineering, you learn some engineering or architecture. You know, or you know, like even if you're just doing English or history, you're learning some writing, and you might need to learn how to be, and might need to write on the job at some point. But still, in terms of why it is that education pays, seems to me that most of it is just uh, this, this uh, sticker on the forehead, and only a small minority of it is really because you learn job skills in school. Now, this makes me think of a couple questions. One is, does this model apply to vocational training? So the mm -hmm. person who goes to school to be, mm -hmm. or to, to, to get trained to be a welder, that seems, yes. th this is right. an exception? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I would definitely say that there's a lot less signaling going on in vocational education. Uh, there's the question about, you know, is it any? There is an argument that people have made suggesting that actually vocational education, sent, you know, though it builds more skills, sends a negative signal. That, oh, you couldn't uh, yeah, get, yes. you couldn't yeah, qualify yeah, for yeah, the yeah. So, you know, there, there's a common view that uh, there, there's a big stigma attached to vocational education. So, who would do welding other than someone that wasn't that wasn't very smart or or just had had had, had a bunch of different issues? Uh, so, and if this and if, and so if the stigma theory theory was true, this would mean that actually, uh, when you go and get some vocational education, you lower people's opinion of you, while at the same time that you're improving your productivity, <laughs> and then the payment uh, the payment is basically a, a net payment for you sent a bad signal, but you got more skills. And so, uh, so on, this, on this theory, actually, more than 100% of the payoff for vocational education is due to the job skills that you're getting. Now that leads right into my next question, which is what about on-the-job training as an alternative yes. to all this? Yes, so on-the-job training is awesome. Uh, there is quite a bit of work uh, on the, you know, just the, 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 benef the benefits for your career of having actually had a job. Um, you know, you're like, you know, so anyone who's in college right now, you don't have to convince them of this. Everybody knows that you need to go and get an internship. And if it's an unpaid internship, still, people will fight like mad for unpaid internships. Yeah. Why on earth? Because, uh, you, you know, you, so you, you, again, at least a lot of it is because that's the, you're, there's a rare chance to actually learn how to do something. So you spend all this time in school <laughs> learning stuff that you're never going to need to know it again. And then finally, you can get a job where you actually learn how to do something anyway. Right. 
Um, so, you know, like it may, it may be, there could even be, you know, some signaling involved in internships where you, at least you want to show that someone, that you impressed people enough that they wanted to hire you again. But, but yeah, so like, you know, this is another great way. Now, many people are, especially economists are inclined to say, well, you know, like, like, you know, this vocational stuff may sound good or on the job stuff may sound good, but it's failed the market test. Employ, uh, clearly employers really want people that with, with, with degrees. And to this I say, you know, fail the market test, there's almost a trillion dollars of government subsidies every year in favor of the status quo. Mm. So how can you say that vocational education has failed the market test or that internships or on the job training has failed the market test? Why don't we go and revoke the subsidies and then see what happens? So uh, this makes me think, uh, we're sitting in this room here, you're a professor. Oh yeah. So how do you respond to people say, well, isn't this hypocritical? I'm a whistleblower. <laughs> okay. You know, if I were not a professor, no one would believe me well, when, when I said all these things. They would just say, it's just sour grapes, you're some loser, couldn't get an academic job, and now you're bitter. I hear that a yeah, lot. So, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Unfair, but nevertheless. Uh, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a full, I'm a full professor of George Mason. I, I get my PhD from Princeton, my undergraduate degree from Berkeley. I've got all the right stamps on my forehead, which I think puts me in a unique position to blow the whistle on this corrupt system that we have. Yes. Uh, so you know, there are enormous subsidies of which I'm a beneficiary, and I'll say I feel a bit guilty. I think someone ought to go and tell the people their money's being wasted, and it looks like it's got. To, I I have to be that person because I don't see other people doing it. Now this is a great topic to kind of close on because I am trying um, myself to get around the barriers to entry in oh, yeah. the market of the production of high quality ideas, especially mm -hmm. in philosophy. And I think we're at the very beginning of seeing a shift, specifically because of the internet. You, I don't have to go in and get the credentialing before I can mm -hmm. write some article on the metaphysics of logic, put it up for anybody on planet Earth to read if they have an internet connection. Mm -hmm. So do you have any um, intuition as to where the future of what you might call intellectual or nerdy mm -hmm. academic work mm -hmm. is going to be in the future with the internet. Do you think it's we're, we're going to see a change, or do you think it's going to, people are going to be more entrenched in this system? Yeah. So I have two different views on online education. Uh, first one is that it's awesome, and it's just amazing to me that there is now this cornucopia of enlightenment that is available online. If you told me this when I was in high school that something something like this would exist, I would just say it won't exist for a thousand years. This is like just dream on. It's fantasy, wishful thinking. Uh, so we, right now, anyone on earth who wants to learn about any subject can do it essentially for free, you know, as long as they've got an internet connection, like you said. And you know, even people in very poor countries can still do this. So you know, as someone who really loves learning and, and the quest for enlightenment, I think it's just so wonderful that online education is out there. And you know, like, it, it, I think this is you know, a lot of high quality stuff. The best lecturers will go and give away their lectures for free. So you know, that's wonderful, but in terms of how the, what's going to happen in the markets, what mm -hmm. I see is, what I see coming is so, you know, more is more of the same. Where there's a two tier system, there's the one there, there's the official one in academia where we give out the official stickers that employers take seriously, and that one is going to you know again, I think it may decline a little bit, but I don't I don't think that any big revolution is coming. I don't see that there's that is that, that anything's going to do to higher ed or K through twelve certainly what uh, the internet did to recorded music or anything like that. Um, but, you know, so anyway, so, for, you know, so we're going to have the, you know, the, 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 tier, well, the tier that I'm in where you get paid to do the old stodgy thing. And then there's going to be the other tier on the internet where it will continue to be essentially free. Right. Right. And again, like, you know, even charging a penny for an essay on the internet would probably reduce your demand by 99%. There's just too, it's just too much of a pain in the neck and there's too much great free stuff. So it seems like the, the, the free price point is, ve is very much a part of the internet. It's really hard to get people to pay anything for, uh, for this, regardless, you know, you know, in a world where, where there's just so many other alternatives that you can get for free. And I think this is just going to continue. So my view is that online education isn't going to compete with traditional education. It's going to compete with blogs. It's going to compete with SEO. It's really just part, you know, part of this giant smorgasbord of wonderful intellectual enlightenment that, that they're for free. This is bad news for someone who wants to make a living mm -hmm. uh, in an untraditional way as, as uh, in the market for ideas, although of course it's great news for consumers. Are you more pessimistic when it comes to the quality of the ideas that are on the internet? So somebody, for example, that's really, really excited about philosophy, wants to not only be a big consumer of philosophy, but wants to be a creator of philosophy. 
do you think that there's a way just purely intellectually mm -hmm. to learn about and fully grasp the ideas as an autodidact or is there some there is there is there uh, a necessary need for formal education in order to grapple with the, the deepest concepts. Yeah, so definitely no need for formal education. There, I, I think there is generally a need to talk to other people who know what they're talking about. Right. So you know, like you know, I, you know, I, I write interdisciplinary books, so I would I consider myself an autodidact. A lot of you know, I, of course, I'm, you know, luckily as a professor, I, I get to meet a lot of people in a lot of different areas, so I can talk about these ideas that I just read about with pe with people who can then give me. The, the, the wisdom of people who have been studying it uh, for, you know, for, for their whole lives, who haven't written it down. Uh, but still, uh, you know, like, like before I publish anything, I reach out to people in all these different fields and say, look, I've read all this stuff, but is there something that, there's, is there some wisdom that hasn't been put down in words that I'm missing? Right. Or am I somehow just not getting the point of this? So like, you know, I think it, you know, there is a danger in reading all by yourself in total isolation and not communicating with other people. Right. But this can be remedied just by reaching out to people, and again, the internet is great for this. Uh, but yes, to whether you need formal education to do this, you know, no, totally you don't. So, I mean, not like you know, there are plenty of people who become experts in subjects where they've never taken classes in it. Uh, my former colleague, or my, you know, say he's passed away, Gordon Tullock, he was one of the most famous economists of the 20th century. He, I think, he never actually even took a class in economics. Wow. But he read a lot and he talked to a lot of people who uh, who, had, who, uh, who were who, who were already experts, and so he became an expert himself that way. You know, like what I would say is if I only knew what I've learned in, in classrooms, I would just know nothing practically. It would just be <laughs> like, like the level, the, the, my ignorance would just be so appalling. Maybe I could still be a professor despite that because I could have learned just enough to go and, and extend an academic literature and get some publications. But in terms of knowing anything about the world, I mean, like what you're, to, what you're taught in classrooms is such thin gruel that you, know, like you, just, you just would really know next to nothing. Well, on that note, I completely agree, and I want to thank you again for sitting down and speaking with me. This was great. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Good luck with your project. Thank you. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Brian Kaplan. He's written a lot of great articles that you can read online as well. The link is in the show notes page, steve-patterson.com slash four. And I highly recommend his best-selling book, The Myth of the Rational Voter. Dr. Kaplan also has many other unorthodox ideas about ethics and philosophy of mind even, so I hope that I'll be able to speak to him again sometime in the future. All right, so that's the show. Thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. Leave a review if you can and enjoy the rest of your day.